Hey, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. I'm your host, Parker Setacase, and this is a podcast where we explore all the deepest ideas in philosophy, theology, nature, and life. I love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. This episode is another very special one. They're all super special, but this one's especially special. I have with me once again, Dr. Michael Humer, and this time we're going to be talking about philosophy more generally construed. Uh, we're going to be talking about like philosophy of philosophy type stuff. Some people might call it meta philosophy, but just what what is philosophy? What's the difference between analytic, continental, historical, classical philosophies? And um, he's the guy to do it. I had I had um, some other people on to talk about this. I'm in a class right now where we're trying to come up with a definition of philosophy as as vain as that effort is. So I figured I might as well ask uh, one of the best around doing it. So. Uh, before we jump in, I want to thank everyone who's making this podcast happen over on Patreon. I love you guys. This is awesome. I really appreciate it. The lights got to stay on somehow. And so if you guys appreciate this podcast, if you learn something from it, if you enjoy it, please consider becoming a Patreon patron, or if you're watching on YouTube, you can join YouTube members and you guys will get uh, early access to episodes, stickers, and all sorts of fun stuff. So you can check, check those out. You can click the links and just see uh, all the different benefits. Please consider doing that. That'd be awesome. Another way to support the podcast is I've been invited to MindFest in Florida by uh, Dr. Susan Schneider. She's been on the podcast to talk about artificial intelligence and stuff. She's awesome. And she invited me to come down and podcast with some of the speakers there. Um, there's some pretty epic people there. So uh, I'm putting it on you guys. If you guys want to send me down to represent the Parker Pensies uh, community, but really more so to, uh, to get a bunch of sweet episodes and bring them back to you, then please consider uh, giving to the GoFundMe in the uh, in the link in the description wherever you're getting this at. That will be next month in March sometime. Uh, awesome. So check that link. You can see the whole program list as well. All right. Well, that's probably enough commodification. Let's jump in with Dr. Michael Humer and let's get into like the philosophy of philosophy type stuff. Dr. Humer, thanks so much for coming on again, man. <laughs> Hi, it's great to be here. You, you, you made a great quip. Uh, and I have to bring it back up, but you said you can really never have too much humor. And uh, that's right, that's on, right. on several accounts, that's right, uh, yeah. which is awesome. Um, I clipped out from the first time you came on the podcast, I clipped out a little excerpt of you discussing like three things that uh, every philosopher should be able to do. And I put that on TikTok. I put it on uh, YouTube and Instagram and it blew up and a bunch of people were like, yes, amen. And all the continentals were like, how dare you? I'll destroy your being. Um <laughs> So How I figured you support giving arguments. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, and some were even like, well, that's ironic because he's not giving an argument here. And I'm like, oh, really? Like a 30 second clip that I clipped out doesn't have the full podcast episode in it. That's crazy. <laughs> um, but I, I figured since it got so much play and so much interest, it would be nice to do a whole episode on it. And since you've written uh, several fake news uh, articles on it, I thought it'd be really good to dive in. Before we talk about analytic continental divide and classical or historical philosophy, um, what what is this subject? What is philosophy? Oh yeah, uh, uh, I don't know. Um, you know, I I talk about this in introductory philosophy classes, but um, you know, basically, no philosopher has ever defined anything um, correctly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, philosophers have defined a lot of things, but none of them have been accepted none of the definitions have been widely accepted and the reason for that is that most concepts are indefinable hmm. so anyway so you know if somebody actually doesn't know what a word means then what you do is you give them examples of of the thing that it refers to so like if somebody didn't know what green was you wouldn't try to give them a definition of green yeah you would try to show them something green yeah so like if somebody actually didn't know what philosophy was, what you would do is give them examples of philosophical questions. Mm. And so when I do this in a philosophy class, I do uh, the ship of Theseus and yeah. talk about that problem. And then, and it's a good example. Like, it, I don't, you know, maybe it's not the most important philosophical question, but it's a very good example of a philosophical question yeah. because you can very clearly see that it's not a scientific question and it's not a religious question either. And, yeah. you know, it's not anything else other than philosophical, right? So, yeah, you know, you notice some things about that. Like one thing is um, the sort of um, it, it either doesn't require empirical evidence or it only requires the kind of observations that everyone has. Yeah. 
And there's no like scientific investigation to do that's going to be helpful. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, you can't do an experiment on the ship to find out if it's really the same ship. Right. You don't need to make more careful observations. As a matter of fact, you just stipulate all of the descriptive facts about the case. So yeah. you know, no investigation needed. But, yeah. you know, also another thing that's interesting about it is um, it's very far reaching because, you know, almost everything is a composite object. Yeah. It's really not a problem about ships. It's a problem about composite objects, like any object that has parts, you know, you can do this ship of Theseus thing with it. Another yeah. thing that you notice about it is that, you know, although um, it's not susceptible of scientific investigation, there are um, pretty clear arguments that could be made. Like, mm -hmm. it's not just like I'm going to randomly speculate, like there are reasons that can be given for one answer or another. It's just the problem that there are reasons for competing answers. So, yeah. right. And, you know, often like with philosophical questions, you wind up with a kind of dilemma where it's like none of the answers seem good. Right. right. So like with a ship of Theseus, you're like, okay, so if I say it's the same ship, then, well, it looks like there's no limit to how much you can change something. Mm -hmm. and still say that it's the same, which is kind of weird. It's, it's a little bit weird if something is the same, even though it has 0% commonality. Right. Um, and, you know, if you buy that, then you can also imagine rearranging the parts in addition to <laughs> replacing them. So, yeah. you know, you can change it into a house or something and still say it's the same object. So um, anyway, okay, so like that doesn't seem good. But then if you say it's not the same, then when did it become not the same? Yeah. And basically it's going to turn out that it has to be the first time the first part was replaced. Yeah. And then that's going to imply that, you know, no composite object lasts, right. Or no macroscopic object lasts for more than a fraction of a second. Yeah. Yeah. And it, cause you could go with like, you, you're, you're like a muriological essentialist and you're like, you can't change anything. And so you can't take out a, a screw or anything, but it, it goes even deeper than that too. Cause maybe like an atom got sloughed off. Yeah. Before that. So it's like, yeah, it doesn't survive anything. Yeah. You know, an electron wandered too far away. <laughs> right. Right. Um, yeah. And so anyway, yeah. So like, this is fairly typical of philosophical questions. It's like, um, um, there are very strong arguments against, you know, each of the answers that you can think of. Yeah. Right? Or there are strong arguments for competing answers, uh, you know, very far reaching and non-empirical. So like, that's pretty typical of philosophical questions. Yeah. Um, so I could see someone, you know, very like pragmatically being like, well, if there's no solution, then why even go about doing if And if that's what philosophy is, then why even do that? Yeah. Why do that? <laughs> because it's amazing and fascinating. Yeah. So, like, <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, you know, we like, we try to figure out what the answer is. So there are a lot of puzzles and paradoxes, but you know, I Entire know books we, on those even. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And, um, but, you know, we don't throw up our hands and say, oh, nothing could be done. Rather, we try to think it through. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, um, figure things out. I, I, so I mentioned books on it because you have a book on paradoxes. Uh, yeah, it's good. But I, I don't think I've read the part on yeah, the ship of thesis. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. And I should, I should also say there's a great intro book to philosophy, knowledge, reality, and value. And we've taught, we've done a whole episode yeah. on this yeah, uh, by a, Dr. Michael Humer. Uh, uh, yeah, super good. The endorsements alone are worth the book. Um, Plato endorses it. And um, do you do you have a like? Do you have a particular solution that you like uh, to the ship of Theseus? Oh yeah, actually, another thing that's um, common with philosophical questions is that you know they're not necessarily to be answered in the terms in which the question was posed. Like, uh, like yeah. it appears that the answers are yes, it's the same, and no, it's not. But mm -hmm. um, when you think about it more, you feel tempted to say something else, like maybe there were degrees of sameness, mm -hmm. so it was the same to some degree, right? Or, you know, maybe, maybe it's indeterminate, right? Or yeah. maybe it's a merely semantic question, mm -hmm. All right? So I'm tempted to say it's a merely semantic question. And so it's just a matter of convention. We can just decide whether we want to call it the same ship or not. Yeah. And like, yeah. uh, you know, maybe there's no fact about identity of ordinary material objects. Uh, this would be a way in which they're different from persons, I assume. Is that is that muriological nihilism, just saying there are no, like, there are no objects, even though they appear to us? Well, I, I mean, I'm tempted 
tempted to say conventionalism, right? Oh, okay. It's a matter of convention, but our conventions are typically not to say that there aren't any composite objects. So, you know, yeah, you're, you're violating the norms of the language if you say that. Well, so it should doesn't the convent doesn't conventionalism um, say that there, there is a fact of the matter? Like, even if we just um, even if it's just convention, wouldn't we want to say that like we didn't just make it up whole cloth? We're still like recognizing something out there. Well, uh, let's see. Um, yes, but there are multiple different ways the conventions could go that would still count yeah. as recognizing something. And okay. yeah, so and there are, there are like reasons for drawing conceptual boundaries in some ways rather than others. They don't uniquely determine how they should be drawn. And also, actually, we haven't ourselves decided exactly how the boundary should be drawn. Yeah. Uh, but there are some ways of drawing them that would clearly just not be, I don't know, not be useful. Hmm. So, yeah. so if we start talking as if material objects never exist for more than a second, then it's just going to be a lot more annoying to have conversations, <laughs> and, you know, yeah. and then, yeah, like I, I bought a car yesterday and, uh, oh, do you still have the car? No, <laughs> it's like, yeah, you know, yeah, I have right. another car though, which looks <laughs> a lot like it. Right. Um, <laughs> Well, insurance would be a, a complete mess. You know, you sign an insurance on this car, but then it changed. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, instead of saying the car, we would have to say the car and its successors. And we have to define yeah. the successors as yeah. other things that are very similar to this car, you know, yeah. which, right. which, which were produced by this car by substituting parts. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, okay, so you said that uh, most philosophical or most concepts are like either indefinable or we just haven't, we're not able to define them, whatever the case. Um, do you go in for, do you like like family resemblance language? Is that helpful or, or not really? Yeah. I mean, I guess, well, um, I mean, the way that I think of it is, so there, there's a space of possibilities, you know, like mm -hmm. the um, space of ways that objects could be, which mm -hmm. is many dimensional maybe there's an indefinite number of dimensions yeah. and concepts pick out regions. Each particular object is at a specific point in the space, the quality space, and a concept picks out a region in the quality space, Yeah. regardless of whether there are things in that region. So it applies to a certain region. Some parts of the concepts region might be unoccupied in the real world. Like a unicorn space or something or yeah. Yeah, not, yeah, not unicorn yeah, space. The concept, the concept unicorn unicorn. picks yeah. out a region that's unoccupied. Right. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. And so, and, you know, what does it mean to be definable? Well, what it means for a concept to be definable is that you can take other regions that are picked out by other concepts. You can perform set theoretic operations like, uh, you know, intersection and union and subtraction and yeah. form the same region. <laughs> this is awesome. Right. Yeah. And now, so. You know, like if knowledge was defined as justified true belief, then it would be so there's the there's the knowledge region or sorry, there's the justified region, the belief region, the true region, and then the intersection of those would be the knowledge region. Yeah. Um, OK, but it just like, you know, that's not usually the way it works. It's like yeah. usually and even if it started out that way at some time, you know, language drifts, meanings of words drift over time according to how people use them. So yeah. it wouldn't stay that way. Yeah. And so, you know, like if, if you started by defining something as justified true belief and, you know, you called it knowledge, and then, well, mm -hmm. but, you know, a few centuries later, people are going to be using the word knowledge and the boundaries of that concept are no longer going to coincide with right. you know, the justified true belief boundaries. Yeah. I, I hate, I hate knowledge drift or uh, language drift type stuff. Like uh, today people be like, let's not get into semantics. It's like, well, you probably should get into some semantics here or you know, don't be so trivial. And you're like, the, the, are you referring to the trivium, like logic and grammar and rhetoric? Like, it's kind of important stuff. Like, super sad. I hate that. Um, well, OK, so speaking of, of uh, you know, language drift, um, depending on who you ask, people will go with the etymology of philosophy. You know, philosophy is the love of wisdom. And I'm like, I don't know, read contemporary philosophy. And I, it doesn't seem like that. Um, mm. Why do you think, why do you think that uh, the etymology like has stuck? And, and what do you make of that? Do you think it's a, a decent, like family, well, does that pick out anything that, that philosophy is doing today? 
Um, I mean, there's surprisingly little discussion of wisdom, you know, in a discipline that is the love of wisdom. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. I, yeah. And like philosophers don't seem all that wise, mm. right? Like maybe they're, maybe love of knowledge is closer. Yeah. But anyway, I mean, this is basically just like there was an earlier use of the word philosophy. So it used to be a lot broader. Yeah. So, you know, philosophy used to be just like, you know, learning in general, just trying to understand the world in general. Yeah. Uh, nat natural science used to be called philosophy of nature or natural right. philosophy. And then it broke off to be considered a separate thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, I don't know whether this is a better way of classifying fields, but anyway, that's what happened. So now philosophy is only the stuff sort of like contemporary philosophy is, you know, the old sense of philosophy minus science or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I always think we should go on a, on a crusade and get them back and, and, and suck them back under the philosopher's auspices. Yeah. Um, and but... and I, I'm not even sure that wisdom is a good translation of Sophia. I don't, I mean, so I don't speak Greek, but yeah, like it, it doesn't sound like even at the beginning, it was really love of wisdom per se, mm. right? They're talking about all kinds of things that just don't seem to be very wisdom related. Yeah. Yeah. Like, um, I don't know, like, yeah, like mathematics and stuff like that, where I, I guess you can apply it to life in a wise way. But if you're just sitting around thinking about, you know, like they weren't thinking about set theory, but whatever geometry or something, it's just a cool thing to think about. And it, it might not have a whole ton of, practical import um because yeah okay you can make a shape and you can make a circle sure but then if you want to do like the calculations on uh, like if you're if you become a geometer instead of uh uh an architect like okay there's not a lot of practical thing it's just it's because of the love of yeah. the knowledge of of it yeah, that's yeah. A good well point. but yeah you know like even having practical knowledge like i wouldn't describe engineers as wise people <laughs> like, yeah they're really good at doing certain stuff, right? Yeah. They're good at yeah. some practical tasks, but I don't even, yeah. I don't know exactly what wisdom is. It seems to have well, yeah. some kind of practical import. Yeah. So I was, that's, a, that's, it, it invites another question. Like who, who is, who is wise? Do you have anyone that comes to mind today? Like who would you say is a, is a wise person? Oh, uh, wow. I don't know. That's, not, <laughs> that's scary. I don't know. That's sad too. Do we have any wise men in this society? I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, how about like a historical figure that was that was wise? Does anyone pop up for you? Um, Gandhi, maybe. Okay. He's, he seems pretty wise, I guess. Yeah, maybe Gandhi. Maybe like Abraham Lincoln. You think he was wise? I'm not sure. You know, what I about, heard bad what about, about him. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> what about cool, cool Calvin uh, Cal Coolidge? Yeah. He's, yeah, he seems are. wise, like yeah. Uh, I don't, I don't know much about him except that he didn't oh, do okay. very much. So that's kind of yeah. Good. I was good that's what I was pulling. I was pulling on your libertarianism there. And there's a, like oh, like, there's Lao Tzu, you know, the founder of Taoism. Oh yeah, okay, okay. So these He's are some wise folks. Um, okay. Another question. Uh, this one might just be like me projecting and stuff, but who who gets to be called a philosopher today? Uh. I don't know, like, who do I call a philosopher? I don't know. Like, I think if you, um, if you want to be a philosopher, then you can be, <laughs> like okay. you can, I mean, you can be an amateur philosopher. Yeah. Cause you know, <laughs> you can't say you're a professional philosopher unless someone hires you, but, um, yeah. And I don't is know. It, like, is yeah. it if someone hires you or like, like if someone had like a YouTube channel and they got paid for it, not me, don't, I don't want to make this about me. Let's say someone had a bunch of followers and they made a living like teaching philosophy on YouTube. Yeah. Would they be able to call themselves a professional philosopher? I guess, uh, I okay. guess so. Yeah. But it's weird. Cause it's like, you're not really part of the guilds though. You, you don't go to like APAs and stuff. That's right. Yeah. Non-academic professional. Yeah. Philosopher. Oh yeah. Okay. This is good. Yeah. Um, That's good. You knocked that uh, down quick. Yeah. Cause like, uh, you know, I don't, um, Socrates is a philosopher, right? Yeah. He wasn't an academic, so you don't well, have to be an academic. I mean, the academy comes from Plato, so maybe, yeah, he actually wasn't an academic in that sense. Um, did he make his living from, I don't think he did. I don't think they made their livings from philosophy back then either. Mm, yeah. So I don't know. Socrates, amateur philosopher. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> That's decent company, probably. Yeah. Um, 
So how about so we talked about wise wise men? Uh, who are, who are some paradigm cases of like pretty good or really good philosophers, uh, either from like uh, last century or or maybe living today? Yeah, other than me, you mean? Uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, you know, so like I had a post in which I um, kind of distinguish good philosophers from great philosophers. Right? Yeah, I like that so, post. That's really I don't good. know, like, like I think Thomas Reed is a very good philosopher. I think Thomas mm -hmm. Reed is sort of better than whatever the major figures in the canon that we usually read mm -hmm. in the sense of better at saying correct things. Yeah. And like not not making obvious errors yeah. but you know like descartes is a greater philosopher <laughs> yeah so like he's more influential he's more important you know if you're doing a history of philosophy class you have to include descartes you don't have to include thomas reed yeah but descartes is wrong and thomas reed is right yeah <laughs> i i was i liked that post it, it was a little triggering um because i'm like man these guys are really good philosophers and you're like well what well, I think that all these, yeah, they're great, but they not, they might not, they might not be really good, and that's a that, that really good distinction that you you brought up. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, I mean, we we still talk about the ideas of many of these historical figures, like Plato, Aristotle, and Kant, and so on. But um, how many people endorse their arguments? Yeah. So, like, uh, you know, you learn about Kantian ethics in an ethics class today, but uh, do you learn the uh, the argument for it like mm. do, do they teach you kant's argument for his ethics no they don't because it sucks it's <laughs> like nobody thinks it's any good yeah and i you don't you probably don't even know what it is no so well uh, so are you talking about like the, the categorical imperative and like if you uh if you abuse this concept then like it would fall out altogether because we is, is that what is that the argument you're talking about uh i mean the argument that I recall is something like he starts talking about the concept of a categorical imperative. And then he yeah. says it has nothing in it except pure universality as such or something. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so good. And then from that, you're supposed to derive that the only moral duty is to act according to a rule that you could will to be universal law. Universal. Yeah. Like, that's pretty wild. Yeah. So, the, all the con the Kantians are probably tearing out their hair right now, but um, but, come on yeah, and talk about it. Their yeah. heads are exploding if, they, if, <laughs> if they would even be watching this. That's right. That's right. I got some Kantians in the crowd. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. Okay. So, so some people will talk about um, like really good philosophers and, and they do mention you, which is, which is awesome. And they mentioned Timothy Williamson and I brought that up to him mm -hmm. too and made him blush a little bit, but uh, uh, yeah, a lot of it's because, cool. yeah, a lot of it's because of the scope you guys work on, because um, you do good work at scale, and you know, it, it, talking about a lot of different topics. And then some people will point to like world builders, uh, like David Lewis and David Armstrong. And I don't, I don't know if I see uh, like you and Williamson as like world builders. It just seems like you guys just like love philosophy and like talking about it in lots of different areas. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Would you call yourself a world? Are you building a world in systematically through your work? Well. Building a system, uh, I don't, I don't know. I probably not. Yeah. Um, so, I have philosophical views on many different topics, which right. you know, also David Lewis did. But yeah. I don't um, like they're not obviously all connected. Yeah. Right? So, hopefully you know, they're not they're not like incoherent with each other or something like that. But they're not necessarily yeah. like part of a system. Yeah. So. And, um, you know, the reason for this is that reality is actually complex. And so, yeah. like, if you're solving every problem with one idea, then you're probably wrong. Like, what you're yeah. probably doing is distorting things and overlooking, you know, aspects of the problems that don't fit your one idea. Because it's yeah. highly unlikely that one idea actually is the answer to all the philosophical problems. Yeah, that's a good point. So it's not phenomenal conservatism. I, I have to do more reading than that. Well, that's the, yeah, that's the core theory of justification, Yeah. you right. know, but like, you know, how, how do we solve the paradoxes of the infinite? Well, that's just like a completely different story. Well, it just seems to me that there's a solution. Nah, no, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's good. Um, what? Okay. Uh, I want to get into the continental analytic stuff, but I got a couple more just general ones for you. Uh, do you think, do you think of philosophy as more of an art or a science? Oh, uh, huh. I don't know. Uh, I, 
I mean, it's not either, but yeah. uh, I guess it's more like a science as far as I understand that distinction. Okay. So like, I uh, guess an art is, I guess the distinction is like, you know, is it a body of knowledge versus a practice where you, you know, you have to acquire skills to whatever. Okay. Yeah. So like piano playing is an art, I guess, right? Because it's not that yeah. you need a bunch of factual knowledge, it's that you have to have skill at playing it. Yeah. Uh, so it's more, okay, so it's more like a science in that regard. Um, what what do you take to be like the, the main goal of philosophy? Do you think there is one? Oh, uh, I don't know. I guess like increasing our understanding. That's good. Increasing understanding of the world and our place in it and such. Do you think... Do you think you could call philosophy at the love of understanding and that would be a better term than like the love of wisdom? Yeah, that seems more accurate. Yeah, it seems to me that philosophers love understanding stuff. But otherwise, they wouldn't do philosophy and they would yeah. do something else. Like there's a lot of other things you could do with your life. Yeah. We love trying okay. to understand stuff anyway. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> um, yeah, I mean, like it doesn't it doesn't really seem like wisdom is is the right description there. Yeah, that's good. Um, okay, last thing here. So uh, George Beeler has this uh, this concept of like first philosophy that f there's this uh, autonomy of philosophy that there are domains of philosophical inquiry that are completely outside the scope of science, and then the authority of philosophy that's like insofar as science and uh, philosophy purport to um, comment on the same phenomena or something philosophical question, then philosophy wins in most cases, not every case or anything. Um, but the support that science could in principle use, uh, is not as good as the, uh, evidence that philosophy could in principle use. Uh, do you, do you have any thoughts on like first philosophy and the, you know, uh, autonomy and authority of uh, philosophy over science? Hmm. I mean, that's a little bit puzzling. I mean, it, it's weird to me to talk about like which has better evidence without having a specific problem. Yeah. And a specific piece of evidence. Like, well, uh, that's, yeah, that's a good point. Can there be, so there's a scientific argument for P and there's a philosophical argument against P. And yeah. so which one is more likely correct? So you got to tell me what the arguments are. Um, okay. But I mean, what's likely going to happen. So there, there are cases that I can think of that sound like that, but in, you know, and in which I would say the philosophical argument is correct. However, I would also say the scientific argument is like, you know, a mistaken scientific argument. It's not a good scientific oh, argument. Oh, yeah. And, no, that's a good point. And yeah. then the people who disagree with me would, would also say like that they have philosophical arguments on the other side. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, you know, I think about things like, um, you know, absolute simultaneity. Yeah. And then, you know, like there's a scientific argument against it, but I don't think it's exactly a scientific argument. <laughs> I right. think it's partly philosophical. Yeah. So I think like, you know, Einstein was um, influenced by illogical positivism. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Logical positivism. <laughs> I keep, yeah. I keep misnaming it. <laughs> yeah. um, I think that's actually part of uh, like the heart of at least the authority of philosophy that it's like, if, if you're talking about philosophical questions, then the philosophers are probably going to have an upper hand because yeah. they're, that's their training. Whereas the scientist who's talking on it, they're, they're scientists, unless they're a philosopher of science, but then again, that's philosophy. So, um, yeah. Yeah. yeah so, I mean, like, it's hard to th think of what the, what the case would be where there's a genuine conflict between scientific evidence. That's not a mistake. Like they're not misinterpreting or whatever. They're not being influenced by bad philosophical views or whatever. It's just like a real good scientific argument. And then, you know, a philosophical argument. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I think that's good. But that that kind of that that kind of uh it plays on like the fact of the matter. And if you don't know the fact of the matter and the science is saying like um yeah, this cat's alive and dead, even though that's like a misinterpretation of what the what the thought experience is supposed <coughs> to take and and a philosopher comes along and goes, "Look, there's this thing called the law of uh contradiction, now called the law of non-contradiction. That can't be." It, it's <laughs> either the cat's dead or it's not dead. It's not in a superposition or something like that of both being dead and not dead. Yeah. I think, well, I mean, what do you, would that be a good case of saying like, no, I guess yeah, just well, the flat, the science, if you think that is, is wrong, it's a misinterpretation and it's a faulty yeah. philosophical point. Yeah. Um, 
Well, okay, so you could have cases where there's um, empirical evidence and then there's uh, a priori evidence, you know, yeah. intuitions that maybe could come in conflict. I mean, in that case, my thought is, so first of all, like, you know, law, the laws of classical logic are self-evident. Uh -huh. And if you think that you found an exception to them, you're just confused. Yeah. That is, you've just misunderstood. You don't like, you don't understand what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, like uh, alive and not alive, those are mutually, mutually exclusive and exhaustive by definition. So if you right. think that you found a cat that's alive and not alive, you're, you don't understand what not alive meant. Right. Because from the fact that it was alive, it's not not alive. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> right. uh, but anyway, so this is like, you know, there can't be evidence against that. Yeah. All right. But anyway, so what's going on is, well, you know, the scientists are just getting confused. Um, they're, they might be not exactly understanding what the law of excluded middle means, even though like it seems kind of simple. Right. Um, and, um, but you know, like, that's just um, a reason for preferring a different interpretation, right? Yeah. That, you know, most, most interpretations of quantum mechanics don't have this, you know, violations of logic stuff. Yeah. Even though they're, in, they're all nuts. They freak me out so bad. Um, yeah, except, yeah. Except for Bohm's interpretation. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I can't do it. I can't do it. I, I, I get lost and it's all crazy to me. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, <coughs> What, what about, um, I don't know, actually, do you, do you mind filling, filling in the audience on that real quick? Oh, what Bohm's interpretation? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know how there's a debate about whether, uh, light is a particle or a wave and yeah. whether other particles are particles or waves anyway. Well, mm -hmm. there are two things. There's a particle, which is always located at a specific point in space. And, um, and there's a wave known as the pilot wave. And the wave evolves according to the Schrodinger equation, you know, deterministically all the time. And the particle is located somewhere on somewhere where the wave is non-zero, where the amplitude yeah. is non-zero, but we don't know where, right? And, you know, you assign probabilities to its possible locations um, in proportion to the square of the amplitude of the wave. Yeah. And this, this is going to get us the right results. And so, you know, what the wave does is just as the wave evolves over time, it pushes the particle around. Yeah. And so, you know, in the double slit experiment, you have the wave go towards the, uh, the wall with the two slits in it. And then, you know, two waves come from the two slits and then they interfere with each other. Yeah. And so that causes there to be this, you know, pattern of wave amplitudes on the screen. Mm -hmm. And then the particle gets directed sort of more directed towards the places where the amplitude is higher. So, so it's not uh, a collapsing of the wave function. Yeah. There's no collapse. Nice. Yeah. That's good. It still, doesn't it turn out to be like the electron is just like a probability then? Like, is it, I don't know. I, I hear people intentionally uh, kind of woo woo this kind of stuff. Yes. So then you're like, well, I'm, I'm confused now, but it seems like like the math folks are like, well, it, look, it all turns out to be math. And it's it's basically just a probability. And you're like, well, I think there's probably still a particle there, right? Like, Yeah. So in Bohm's interpretation, the particle is always located at a definite place. Nice. Uh, but we don't know where it is. And so, so the probabilities that you get are just epistemic probabilities. Nice. I like that, man. That sounds right. It sounds grounded. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, let's jump in from there. Naturally, it leads right into continental philosophy. Um, not quite, but um, <laughs> you, you've you've given so you did uh, you did a piece on fake news, which is an amazing blog. I suggest everyone check that out. The link will be in the description. And you were comparing and contrasting continental philosophy, but it got a little bit long, so you dropped off the uh, like bad against analytic stuff. So yeah. everyone took the continental thing, was like, "This guy's hating on continentals only," and got all mad at you. Yeah. Um, so let's start with that then. Uh, yeah. What is, yeah, what is continental philosophy? Oh, uh, I don't know. Other than a bunch of nonsense. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, yeah, it's a sort of a style of philosophy practiced on the continent, the continent referring to Europe as yeah. opposed to England and um, the US and, you know, Australia, the other English speaking countries. Basically, you know, like it's mostly French and German people. 
Yeah. You know, like Heidegger and Foucault and whatever. Yeah. Um, okay. And uh, so it turns out that those people have, um, you know, like the, there are family resemblances among them. Right? Mm-hmm. And um, the sort of the style of philosophy uh, I would describe as having a lot of, you know, vague abstractions in, mm-hmm. you know, gesturing and not giving very clear or sharp arguments uh, and not really, not really addressing objections or anything. And yeah. also um, there's, you know, the, the content of their views tend to have some overlap. So they, they tend to be more subjectivist yeah, and, uh, you know, suggesting that reality depends on observers or whatever. Right. And they also tend to be less rationalist, right. That is, mm. Uh, and I mean, you know, rational as opposed to irrational, <laughs> not rational as opposed to empiricist. Yeah, I mean, right. So they're not empiricists. They're, yeah. they're rather, they're people who, I guess, they would put less emphasis on the power of reason. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So what, I mean, you already kind of listed in the definition, some of the problems with it. Um, so real quick, I guess, do you see any any good in continental philosophy? Are there any like continental philosophers that stick out that you're like, oh, this one is a good one and not necessarily a great one, um, yeah. or or like just some some goods that they do? Like you said, it's a style. Is there anything about the style that is beneficial that that analytics ought to appropriate? Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, I generally think that they just have a you know bad writing. They're just bad. Okay. <laughs> uh-huh. yeah. Some people enjoy it though. So I don't know, it could be increasing utility for some people. Yeah. Um, but I don't quite understand why I feel like maybe, maybe some people like being confused. Mm. And so then they like reading confusing writing because it gives them this feeling of confusion, <laughs> and, <laughs> but, but they probably wouldn't describe it that way. It's probably more like when they're confused, they feel like something profound is happening. That's what, that's what I would think as well. Like if you're using a metaphor and it's not really clear what the point is, then maybe it's open to interpretation and I can, I can interpret it in a way that seems really profound. And maybe it is profound. I don't know. I don't want to totally poison the well, but. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Like, you know, the, the existence of multiple possibilities, it just seems like um, maybe it seems more intriguing to people if they're not yeah. sure exactly what it means. It could mean many things, you know, like uh, JJ Abrams TV shows, you know, where <laughs> there's stuff that you never find out what was going on. <laughs> and yeah. then, and he thinks that that's more fun because there's so many possibilities. I hate that. Yeah, I really that that really <laughs> bugs me. Um, oh, so so this is like a, a trope or like a canard or something like a you know um, maybe it doesn't catch reality, but um, people will make these comparisons and say the Continentals at least even if they're unclear, at least they're talking about more like life type stuff. Like maybe they'll talk about love and one con- one continental philosopher will try to address a lot more aspects of life than one analytic philosopher might. Um, yeah. Do you think there's any truth to that? Yeah. I mean, you know, like when I got to my criticisms of analytic philosophy, uh, yeah. yeah, basically analytic philosophers very frequently are talking about trivial details. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Trivial in the sense of not very important. Yeah. Not, not referring to the trivial. <laughs> yeah, um, right. <laughs> Thanks. Um, but, uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, continental philosophers are more likely to be saying something big, right? Yeah. About something important. Yeah. Um, I guess, you know, yeah, like you asked me if there were any good ones. Like, I heard that Husserl was good. I haven't actually read him. So, well, that's like, nice to hear. I, that's the one that I, that I like is, is uh, Husserl. Um, yeah. I do um, like, but it's, he's really hard to understand for me at least. So it's still kind of tough, but people who interpret him, who are analytics, I like what they're saying usually. Yeah. Um, you know, I liked what Sartre had to say about free will. Okay. <laughs> is that, you know, sort of like radical endorsement of um, maybe libertarian freedom. Right. Yeah, maybe. Um, okay. So there's a couple. Yeah, that, that's, that's something I, I think like phenomenology and I want to like um, kick out Heidegger. And be like, okay, he his is something else, but maybe we like stick with Husserl and like even like Frege is kind of close back then. And you go, okay, well, at least they're talking about consciousness, which like the Anglo American world just like forgot about until uh Searle, maybe. I don't know. Like it was just you don't really talk about consciousness and stuff. Yeah, yeah. 
So I like that. I like me some consciousness stuff. That's good. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think it'd be hard to forget about consciousness, but <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but yeah, but like, yeah, this, this would be a good example of the criticism of analytic philosophy. Like, well, we don't understand it. So let's not talk about it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's but, helpful. It's, <laughs> but it's actually really important. Yeah. Um, I, I have, uh, <clears throat> I want to be, I just kind of want to be a philosopher like generally construed. I, I, I've heard you talk about that before. Someone mentioned that about you when they were introducing you. Uh, and I was like, that's, that's good. I just want to do philosophy. So I'll, I'll tell people that I'm studying philosophy and oftentimes they'll be like, oh, cool. What do you think about Nietzsche? And I'm like, oh, not that kind of philosophy. And I'm kind of yeah. tired of it. So I'm like, fine, I'm going to read Nietzsche. I'm going to read all these popular level. I'll read the Stoics too. And I'm going to analyze it for you maybe and chop it back and throw it back at you. But I, you do look what, a bit like Nietzsche. Yeah, that's right. That's part of it. The philosopher look. Um, I I just want there's there's abstract thinkers that are not in the academy and they have a certain view of philosophy. And I'm not trying to say that they get to define what it is, but I at least want to like be able to teach and and be able to interact with what they're talking about. Um, so sometimes that sucks because I have to read like Marcuse. And I don't want to do that, yeah, but yeah. they keep, people keep talking about it. So like, well, all right, well, let me just see. At least I can have an informed opinion on it. Yeah. So uh, I mean, yeah, it sounds boring. Yeah. Uh, it's gonna be, it's gonna be tough. Yeah. I think, yeah, uh, I think Nietzsche is, you know, more fun. <laughs> okay. It's kind, of, yeah. it's kind of fun, but, um, he's probably like, uh, I mean, he's a little bit evil, you know, <laughs> that's good to hear you say, I think that's probably true. Um, for sure. But at least he's, uh, he's going to be more entertaining than whatever Marcuse. Right. Right. Um, so we got, we got continental philosophy. Can you help us? Well, what, what is analytic philosophy? Yeah. I mean, so it's this, the style of philosophy, again, this is like a family resemblance word, right? But the mm -hmm. style of philosophy that's mostly done today in the English speaking world. Yeah. Or like the dominant trend in Britain, United States, Australia, Canada. Yeah. Uh, where, okay. And, um, you know, they tend to emphasize, um, clarity, like, and like the reason it's called analytic is that a bunch of people thought in the 20th century that the job of philosophers was to analyze concepts mm. or analyze the use of language. So like, you know, let's, let's just take the word no and figure out what it means and how it's used. Yeah. Okay. Now that's not, that's not a good theory about philosophy, but it did have a good side effect, which was it caused people to be a lot clearer about what the, what they meant by things. Right. And then, you know, okay. So there's that emphasis on clarity and just making sure that people know what you mean. And then, you know, there's a lot of like logical argumentation. There's an yeah. emphasis on giving pretty clear and sharp arguments Yeah. where like, where it's fairly explicit what your premises are. And then if somebody disagrees, like they can point to exactly where they disagree. Right. Um, there's a pretty good emphasis on uh, actually responding to objections. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like my, um, my main complaint about continental philosophy that you alluded to earlier was um, they don't believe in the three main things that you need. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, three main things you need to be good, good at philosophy is uh, you need to make it clear what you mean. Mm -hmm. Then you need to give arguments for your view. And then you need to address objections. Yeah. Like that's, that's just very basic. Right? That's right. what you should be doing. And the yeah. continental continental philosophers don't really believe in that. So yeah. like, they're very obscure about what they're saying. And then like, it's really hard to find what their argument is. Yeah. And there's like some metaphors and whatever. Yeah. And then, and then they like virtually never address objections. Right. Um, Okay. So, so one thing that, that I've seen people push back on, uh, analytics and they go, Oh yeah. It's so, you know, analytics are so clear. Try reading like, you know, analytic epistemology today or something like that. And they'll, they'll talk about how un it can get so technical that it's unclear. Um, yeah. and you know, there's some, there's some presuppositions about who should be able to read the, the stuff. It's like, well, if it's meant for other academic philo professional philosophers, then why would you expect to, to be able to read that if you're not trained in that discipline? You wouldn't expect to, you know, be able to read like fundamental physics type stuff at that level. But you think, oh, well, philosophy is for everyone. So it, they're not doing something right if they're speaking too high above us. 
But um, one thing that I've noticed about you that you do a very good job on this, at least like you have fake news and you give arguments there and you are clear with your terms, but the a general reader can read that. It's not so analytic that it's like malformed or something. Is that yeah, yeah. is that intentional or, or do you do you have like do you have any kind of rule that you set for yourself where it's like only go that deep if I have to, but if not, keep it at a level? Do you have any? Is that just an accident? Yeah, I mean, well, it, it's um, you know, it's it's meant I don't know to be hopefully read by a lot of people. <laughs> like yeah. I'm hoping that a lot of people could follow it. So yeah. Like, uh, I mean, there are various points at which I explain what something is briefly, which, you know, professional philosophers would already know. Yeah. And, um, you know, but it's brief, so it's not going to bore them too much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sort of like trying to keep as many people on board as possible. Yeah. You know, like there are different ways in which something could be confusing. Okay. Like, so when you read, uh, like when you read a physics book or something, it might be confusing, like a textbook, you know, not a pop physics book. It might yeah. be confusing because the subject is hard. Yeah. Right. And because like you have to do a lot of intellectual work to get into the position to even understand what it's talking about. Yeah. Okay. But that's different from, well, I think it's different from what the continental philosophers are doing. Like they're in intrinsically confusing. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. you know, it's, like, it's not like, um, oh, well, they already explained this in some earlier work. And if you just read that, then you would understand. No, they never <laughs> explain it. Clearly. Right, right. right? In the, like, the physics textbook, well, it's because you had to read these other books first. Right. Because they established all this background and then you could understand it. That's a really good point. Yeah. Okay. Um, something else I've noticed, at least about my analytic friends, is... Man, at least the students, right? Because I'm in this, the student world a lot more. Uh, though I talk with a lot of professors on the show. But a lot of the students are so fascinated by the variables and the set theor theoretic and the Bayesian stuff that it like starts to malform their character. And I'll we'll just be talking and joking in a coffee shop. And they'll be like, wait, what exactly do you mean by this? And like, dude, are you serious right <laughs> now? Like, I have to be able to joke and talk with you as a human being too. Like, don't take that out into the real world. And, uh, I've seen some, it's, it's like, man, you're, you're being malformed by doing this and you need to set boundaries. You need to be able to talk as a human being still. I don't know. Do you have any, any, uh, uh, experience with that? Yeah. I mean, you know, you might have some mildly autistic friends. <laughs> well, I, I think they're putting it on a little bit too. So I don't want to. <laughs> Yeah, don't yeah. don't say that because people are going to think I'm like a uh, ableist or something now. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, there are a lot of uh, intellectual malfunctions that can go on in the human yeah. mind. And yeah. I think, um, I don't know, one of them, you can, you can sort of like just, your mind can get captured by yeah. some formal theory about how you're supposed to interact with the world. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, now I got to start, you know, assigning numbers to mm -hmm. everything that you say to be my credences. And I, <laughs> I know. Right? Got to get out the piece of paper and start calculating. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> well, okay. Yeah. Well, I, I saw again, man. I'm sorry to reference you so much. If that's if that's awkward, but I, I will use you because I'm like, well, he can do the Bayesian stuff uh, with the best of them. But I also have conversations with him, and it rarely comes up where he's like, all right, well, let's do some math here. Let me pull out the board and see what the priors are. And it's like. Now we're, we're, you know, we don't have to do that right now. And a lot of it's, it could just be showing off or whatever. I don't want to psychoanalyze people behind yeah. their backs, at least. Um, yeah. Yeah. Psychoanalyze them in front of them. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Come here. That's well, right. Yeah. So, I mean, like one thing that happens in the academic world is um, if you put more technical apparatus into your paper, like that might help it get published. Right. Like, um, yeah. So, you know, for one thing, I don't know, it's going to sound smart. And for another thing, like, um, if you put some math, you can know that it's right. Yeah. It's like, at least the math part is right, whether or not the interpretation is right. So, yeah. and then you don't have to worry about, you know, the reviewer rejecting it because they disagree with it. Yeah. You're hardening up your soft science or something. That makes sense. I don't, I don't think you'd say that, but I think that's what critics would say. Um, yeah. do you. I don't know. Maybe I can just get your, your thoughts on this. There's this um, probably apocryphal story about Sidney Morgan Besser and J.L. Austin, where Morgan Besser was like, 
I can prove that you can get a affirmative from two negatives or a positive from two <laughs> negatives. And J.L. Austin's like, that's not possible. And like went through like this whole series showing why it's not possible. <laughs> and then he just goes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like totally. Have you heard the story before? I heard a variant on it. Yeah. Yeah. I heard it was like this, this speaker. There's a speaker who's saying, you know, it's so interesting that two negatives make a positive, but two positives don't make a negative. And mm. Sidney Morgan Besser goes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> and that that's, that's kind of what I, I want to, I want that to be part of philosophy as well. You know, like being able to, to make puns and, and, and jokes in your philosophy and, and all my, uh, many of my analytic, professors or friends are like you have to cut this out of your paper there's, there's no room for this i'm like well if i can't make a joke in the paper i'm not writing the paper <laughs> if I, I want it to be readable i want someone to laugh at it and that's the whole point of me writing so um i like i think you do that as well so i like that um yeah. okay what, what are what are we talked about some problems we, we kind of broached them you have this uh tldr too long didn't read Analytic philosophers focus too much on playing with concepts and not enough on thinking about the parts of reality that matter. Does this, um, is this a critique of like the armchair maybe, or is it more like the concept uh, uh, analysis type view or maybe both? Yeah. 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 It's partly about that. I mean, I think there's a thing that can happen to you where you get more focused on the properties of your concepts than on the properties of the objects that those concepts are supposed to represent. Yeah. And now it could be a little hard to see that distinction because I know that, you know, like the concept corresponds to the object. And so, yeah, but sure. you, know, you can, um, you can think of exa some examples that are fairly clear examples of that. So like, um, you know, you have people, people in the free will literature debating about the taxonomy of positions or something like that. Mm -hmm. So that's a case where it looks like you've gotten more obsessed with the ideas and how they're related to each other than with the reality. Yeah, the that's a good point. Um, and then sort of like having semantic debates. So, you know, what counts as falling under this term? Have a debate yeah. about that. That looks like it's, you know, being more interested in the concepts than the object. It's, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm with you on that. I, I think that I understand the analytic impetus to like focus on one thing. So like you wrote your dissertation on this one thing and that's kind of your expertise and you feel confident a little bit more confident talking about that than other things. But because of the, the emphasis on like clarity and being showing your argument and like putting it all out there with no suppressed premises, it's, it's like scary to talk about things that aren't, uh, that don't fall, that you're not as confident in. And so I see maybe that could be why people don't branch out as much in analytic philosophy. Well, what do you make of that? Yeah. Well, I mean, there are definitely incentives to um, keep working on the same thing, right? So mm -hmm. just like as a matter of your actual academic work, um, there are large fixed costs for working on a particular topic. Yeah. Which is you have to read a whole bunch of literature. And so then if you want to write about anything else, then you have to read more literature. And then yeah. you do that every time you write about different subjects. So it's a lot easier to just write about the same thing. <laughs> right? So yeah. so that produces a bunch of hyper specialized uh, and also redundant papers. Yeah. Right? Like you write another paper defending the same thesis. Yeah. Because that's easy. And anyway, and why do you do that? It's like, well, it's not because you wanted to do that per se it's because you have to get tenure you know you get credit for your um for the number of publications that you have so yeah um, yeah that's i don't know i yeah it's so tough the the whole philosophy world is so tough to me um yeah and i and i talk with all of the folks so public philosophers analytic continental and it's it's really hard for me because I want to have a nice little neat bow around things. And uh, each kind of world has their own their own rules and their own ways of doing things. And yeah, like the analytic uh, impetus to keep publishing on the same thing. And some sometimes it's like, well, no, I'm just trying to figure this out. And so I need to stay with this as long as I can. And other people are like, I publish or perish. I had to do this. So yeah. I don't know. It's tough. Yeah, I don't, I don't I mean, think that little kids like, are like, I'm going to get into, I want to study about the world and, uh, you know, whether my green <clears> is your <throat> yellow or something. And then like it, 
fast forward and they're like, I wrote the same paper six times in a row because I don't want to get fired. That's really what <laughs> I think about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, there's, you know, there's a problem if you don't have um, many ideas, you know, yeah. <laughs> you can't yeah. think of another idea, but you need another publication. Yeah. And then, but you know, you might think, okay, but at, at least like you would talk about other philosophical issues just, you know, yeah. with your friends, but you might feel like unqualified to do so. Yeah. And you have to read the literature to do it. And that's going to take a long time. So let's well, not do that. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe this is a proprietary uh, info that you don't want to share, but what do you have any particular methods or um, uh, shoot? What's it called? Do you have any methods for generating ideas? Do you do like particular things and then that helps you? Do you go for walks or, you know, sit down with a blank piece? Right. Uh, yeah, there's a trade something? secret. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, my secret is thinking about things. <laughs> yeah. So my secret is that I love philosophy. Yeah. And, um, but do you have you a know, sp like, specific time? Like, do you set times for yourself to do that? No. Like, it's not like, um, you know, it's not just a job to me right yeah like i'm not publishing things so that i can get paid okay <laughs> like i'm publishing things because i thought of something that was interesting to me and i you know i want to get it out i want to yeah. express the thing that i thought um and so um you know it's more like i, I would just be thinking about stuff just all the time <laughs> yeah <laughs> I'm with you on um, that. I like that. Not because I decided to do it, but because it just happened. So uh, what, what, you know, somebody what, what, says something and then I start trying to think about what I think of that. Well, what makes you, I'm sure you have a lot going. I, I have a lot of ideas. I have tons and tons of journals and I have them for different <laughs> types of things I'm thinking about. Uh, what, how do you prioritize like, oh, this is the one I'm going to write on. Cause I'm sure you have like five or six going that are main things of interest. How do you decide this is the one I'm going to focus on now and put it out there? I don't know. Uh, frequently people these days, these last several years, people invite me to write about something. So oh, cool. I just do that. So, nice. Uh, and that's easy because then I don't have to worry about referees rejecting it. Yeah, that's really nice. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, I know sometimes I write the thing that I think would be easy for me to do. Mm. Okay. So, uh, you know, like I did this uh, textbook in epistemology. Yeah. You know, partly because you know, I've been like doing epistemology for a couple of decades. So like, that's the easiest thing for me to write about. <laughs> and then, yeah. And then, you know, maybe I can bring it to a lot of other people. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, okay. Well, I, I think I told the guests or the audience that uh, we're going to talk about historical philosophy. So I feel like we should probably jump in a little bit there. I mean, and I don't think it will take as long, but um, some folks will call themselves classical philosophers. And um, I only know, actually know one <laughs> academic philosopher who calls himself that. But uh, is, 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 is historical philosophy, is that like the history of philosophy? And, and do you have a category for classical uh, philosophers or are they the same thing? They're just guys that are focused on Plato or yeah. something. I mean, I, I, guess, I guess they're historians of ancient philosophy, right? Okay. I assume. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, sometimes they'll say like, well, I focus on classical, um, classical philosophical questions, including God and you know what's the world made up of and free will like the the broad scope of things but they're not continentals um but they're and i don't know if they're doing it in the ways that the classical philosophers did where you just kind of sit down and go everything's water but they're also not quite analytic philosophers i see uh okay i'm not uh i'm not sure that i've looked at any of their work okay yeah um, yeah so, so let's like, talk I, historical I, then yeah I mean, you know, like, uh, yeah, I mean, we should do philosophy in the sense that the great philosophers of the past did it, right? Yeah. Which is we try to try to figure out the truth. Yeah. And, the, and by the way, like these great philosophers of the past that we're studying, they weren't studying each other. Yeah, right. <laughs> right? Like right. Descartes wasn't a great philosopher because he commented on other philosophers. You know? Right. He probably stole some stuff from Augustine, but he didn't say it in public. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, right. Like, yeah, well, like, because, you know, who cares? Who yeah. cares where it came from? We care about what's true. That's good. Yeah, it is good. I I guess you don't want to pass it off as your own if it's not your own. But I understand. Yeah. What yeah. Yeah. yeah um, well, yeah. Today you would put more footnotes. <laughs> right. And it actually looks better to have more footnotes. Look how much I read to, to write this paper for you guys. Yeah. Um, what about, uh, are you familiar with like the, the history of ideas notion? 
Um, not sure. I think I, I don't know. I people have different views on this, but I've heard that like history of philosophy is more in the philosophy department, and history of ideas is more in the history department. And it's the way like the history of ideas maybe will focus more on like who is Descartes' lover and how did that influence his thoughts and history of philosophy is like oh it was you know Descartes and then it was this and here's his ideas and it's more philosophical than the ideas would be yeah yeah well okay yeah so that you know that makes sense I mean like you know the history of ideas sounds like it's more historical you know like yeah. the, the history of philosophy and philosophy department is a pretty weird discipline yeah because it's not really philosophy and it's not really history. Yeah. Wait, so like, yeah, in a sense, they're talking about historical questions, but they're talking about historical questions that have no historical significance, right? Yeah. Like, you know, like if somebody was trying to figure out, you know, what Napoleon had for breakfast on some specific day, like, yeah. okay, that's historical, but, you know, but, it, but like what he had for breakfast has no impact on anything, right? They're not saying right. that that affected any important thing that he did. They just want to know what he had for breakfast. Okay. Yeah, right. So that's a trivial historical question. Yeah. Okay. And then the question like, well, what thoughts were going through the mind of one specific individual when he wrote a specific passage? Yeah. So that's a historical question, but is it completely trivial? One, right? Yeah. And I, you know, and okay, but this was an important influential figure. Yes, but then what matters for his influence is what people thought he said, not yeah. what was actually going through his mind. Yeah. And then, but it's not really philosophy either, because you're not talking about whether the thing that he thought was true. Right. You're just trying to say, this is a better interpretation of this sequence of words. Yeah. I, so, I caught I caught in your, in your uh, blog post, uh, it was a really good point. You're saying like, what you do is you study these guys and then you try to see if you could say something that doesn't sound like them at all. So like, wouldn't it be crazy if Kant was really a consequentialist? Wouldn't that be yeah. nuts? And, and then you get published on that. And I've seen that a lot. And it's actually genuinely confusing because it's like, well, no one ever, I have all these characterizations of thinkers and it turns out none of them are right. And I understand the nuance there. I get that they're nuanced views, but we can still say Kant was not a consequentialist. So if you're doing that, stop, stop doing that. You're messing with all of us. Yeah, yeah. No, if you talk to historians, it turns out that nobody held any of the views that they're famous for. <laughs> like, right. You know, probably Marx was pro-capitalist. Yeah. Like, Jesus was an atheist. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, um, yeah. No, well, okay. So, you know, just as a side point, um, as I mentioned, you know, Kant being a consequentialist, wouldn't that be crazy? Yeah. Like, I think there is an interpretation. <laughs> like, that is a possible interpretation. Thing, yeah. But it's just that he had a weird axiology. <laughs> okay. It's that the thing that um, a goodwill that's just infinitely more valuable than, you know, pleasure or happiness or any of the other, any of the objects of the inclinations. And there's a passage where he says that. Oh, okay. So you're a consequentialist, but you have that weird view. Yeah. And then you can do, now we can debate on whether or not that's actually true consequentialism. Because yeah. should it, yeah, should it be axiological or. <laughs> yeah that's fair that dang it okay well what we got in there um yeah so now i'm doing the thing i, I know man <laughs> I know. Um, anyway i I, um, I yeah go ahead please yeah like an actual example was when i was in graduate school at, uh, one of the professors was arguing that john locke did not actually have an imagistic conception of ideas Oh, he was man. talking about as ideas were not necessarily like little pictures of things yeah. in your mind, even though there's a passage where he actually says like pictures, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. The professor was saying, well, you know, it could be that they're like pictures in some respects, like yeah. that they have intentionality and they yeah. represent particulars or something. Yeah. Yeah. So I wonder, I wonder, that's, that's, that's fascinating. I wonder, um, how important it is to have history of philosophy like in your curriculum as a philosophy student. Um, some some people put a lot of emphasis on like original thoughts. And so if you say like, here um, here's the uh, hard problem of consciousness and David Chalmers coined that and someone else goes, well, look, that, that goes all the way back to Plato. It's not like Chalmers invented that or Mary's room. There's, you know, that can go all the way. And it's always nice if you can go all the way back to Plato. But <laughs> it's, it's always like the attribution. You don't want to, 
pretend like you're um, coming up with something that you, that you didn't, but also like you're saying, it's like, well, can we just focus on the argument and see if it's a good argument or not? So how, how important is it to know the history of philosophy to be a good philosopher? Oh, uh, hmm, I don't know. I mean, for the sake of, yeah, for the sake of being a good philosopher, it's not important to know where ideas came from or whatever. Okay. That might be part of being good at something else, like being yeah. a generally educated citizen or something. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, um, I mean, like, it's good for people to read um, some of the historical texts, like, it's good for students to read Plato and Descartes. Yeah. You know, I like those guys. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, me too. Okay, but the thing that I don't understand why we have is people arguing about the interpretation of specific passages. Yeah. Well, why does that matter? <laughs> and then, right. And then, like, you know, just for the sake of doing philosophy, well, what matters is to just, like, you know, try to think about what's true. Reading the historical text could be helpful because it could give you, like, big ideas. Yeah. These people usually talk about, you know, much bigger, more important things in the recent contemporary work. Right. Yeah, that, this was a really uh, a rude awakening for me when I entered into philosophical studies because I was I studied theology, uh, and I got two masters in theology, and so I learned how to write theology really well. And a lot of that is uh, hermeneutics. Like you have to understand what this author said, and you have to demonstrate that you know that, and then you kind of chain together quotes in order to make your point. And I tried doing that in a philosophy paper and my professor lost it. I was like, I don't care about any of this. Why are you quoting all these people? Tell me, <laughs> just, you can even just stipulate, let, you know, say he said this, now make the argument. And he was like, live it at me. I was like, dude, that's how I learned. I'm sorry. So I, I had to relearn. And it, when I bounce back and forth writing papers for people, it's like, it's, it's, it's wild trying to remember the rules of different things. But yeah, you actually write, um, I think we read one of your papers about writing philosophy well. And so that was really helpful. So thanks, man. That's 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 good stuff. Oh, good. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'll I'll drop a link to that one too. Uh, you also had this great line about please don't be an Aristotelian, uh, and you were saying like if Aristotle was alive today, he wouldn't be a Aristot an, an Aristotelian because yeah. things have changed. Like we presumably we uh, there's a phrase we we're we're standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, I don't think people believe that. I think they're like we're standing under the shoulders of giants or something because they're yeah. like he got it all right. And it's like, well, if they're we're on his us. shoulders, right? Yeah, if if we're if exactly <laughs> if we're on their shoulders, presumably we can see farther than them. We don't have to make the same mistakes that they've made that we can see obviously. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, like Aristotle's views are uh, reasonable things to think if you're a two thousand year ago <laughs> Greek person, right? They didn't know anything about how the world worked. Yeah. And I, okay. But, you know, like teleology is just throughout his whole philosophy mm -hmm. that things have natural functions and whatever natural ends. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think that's only true for um, conscious beings. <laughs> mm. Okay. But it, it wasn't a stupid thing to think, yeah. you know, back then when they didn't have science. Okay. But this is not a trivial mistake. Yeah. That it's not exactly his fault, but it's wrong. Yeah. And it's just throughout everything that he talks about. So, yeah. <clears throat> okay. I have like, um, the teleology thing got me. I'm not going to chase that, that rabbit. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. uh, I, I want to, you know, maybe if everything was made by God, it does. Right. There you go. Thanks. Function. There you go. Hedging a little bit. Um, that's nice. Uh, I, I do wonder about like being a, uh, the history of philosophy folks, often will say, um, hey, we took a wrong turn somewhere in philosophy. It used to be you join you join a philosophical movement and you're whatever, an Epicurean, <laughs> and it's kind of like a movement and you join it and you live a certain way and it's also supposed to tell you how to live a good life. And I'm like, okay, yeah, that's fine. We, we have changed since then. But I do wonder about like being the philosophical sage and being like someone who can give wisdom to people who some like... Um, okay, here's a good way of saying it or asking it. Do, do you think an ethics professor should be a, a good person themselves? Because in virtue of being an ethics professor, not just in oh. virtue of everyone should be a good person. Oh yeah, yeah. I was going to mention that everyone should yeah. be a good person. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> almost by definition. Yeah. Uh, well, does it help them to be a good ethics professor? Maybe. Um, I mean, there would be something weird about having a deep understanding of what you should do and just not doing it. Like, yeah. Not caring, like. But, uh, maybe that's not impossible, but I, I would think it's unlikely. Okay. 
Well, um, okay, yeah, I guess you could you could be like, um, I don't know, like a nihilist or something, and be like, look, here's what everyone else said about ethics. I think they're all wrong, so I'm gonna be, you know, like a just a rabid egoist, but it's like a principled view, I guess, yeah. if that's possible. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. So, I was I, I put this on Twitter the other day, and a lot of people were commenting on it. And a lot of people were saying, you don't have to be a good person to be a good ethics prof. And I did a follow-up and said, do you have to be a good person to be a uh, emeritus professor of philosophy of mind? And that didn't get as many likes because that's a little spicy. But, uh, <laughs> we don't have to comment on that. But yeah, uh -huh. it's just funny. It's funny where it's like, no, not for ethics. And it's like, well, but we're also, we will cancel you if you're kind of a scumbag. And it's like, well, I, I don't know how I feel about that, right? But I, I think that you should probably be consistent, right? Well, so, yeah, like, you know, to be an ethics professor, like, I don't know, like you could teach the class in, well, in a sense of like, you're clearly explaining what people have said in ethics. Yeah. Like, yeah, you could do that even if like you're an asshole, I guess. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I was thinking more about, you know, being a good researcher, like pushing forward our ethical understanding. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. And if you don't know, like the phenomena of what you're studying, maybe maybe that's part of it, like knowing from a first person yeah. about yeah. ethical behavior. Yeah. I mean, I suspect that bad people have less understanding of ethics. OK. Um, so and, you know, I'm not like I'm not like Socrates. I don't think it's impossible I was gonna to do something thought, yeah. that, you know, is wrong. Okay. But I think like people who are just like generally bad or are, are likely to have a lower level of understanding. Okay. Yeah, that's helpful. Um <clears throat> Yeah, man. I Yeah. I, oh, but yeah, yeah, like, you know, should we should we be uh canceling the professors who are assholes? <laughs> they're, yeah. They're bad. You yeah. know, like, well, if they're doing bad stuff to the people at the university, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But if they're doing bad stuff in some unrelated way, you know, like, I don't know if it's illegal, call the cops, but if right. it's not illegal, then I don't know why it's the university business. Yeah. And that's fascinating. And that's the example that I brought up. That's why you can slap that one back down because it was the students and stuff, I think, too. But, but, um, yeah. So in their private life, if they're like really into weird stuff or they're like a scum, scumbag or something, it, it, it may not, uh, it may not have any import for whether or not they're a good ethics professor. Mm. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, like the, the level of stuff that people teach in like an undergraduate class, it's like, it's sort of, it's not so hard and subtle right. that an asshole can't teach it. Yeah, <laughs> like, right. Like, you don't need like the most refined, perfect understanding of morality. Yeah. And, and you don't even have to believe it. You know? Right. You just like teach what ethicists are saying. Even Right. Like, yeah. But in like a in like a grad seminar class on applied ethics, would would it make any difference there? Um, you know, I mean, it might have an influence on the person's views. Like, oh yeah, bad sure. people are. I guess bad people would be more likely to think bad things about applied ethics. I guess mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like I don't know, like the person who thinks that it's fine to take bribes, <laughs> the guy who's <laughs> taking bribes is more likely to think it's fine to take bribes, or right. <laughs> And that, that might be the guy you want uh, teaching your class if you are, are particularly a bad student, because then you can just bribe them into an A. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So there are there are uh, implications for life, folks. There there we go. We got we just found a couple. Um, Dr. Humor, this is this has been so good. I, I recommend everyone go and, and follow the blog. Um, it's fake news dot uh, uh, substack dot com. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'll, okay, and I'll, I'll leave the link in the description. Um, you just came out with this book, uh, on knowledge, uh, and I'm stoked to, to get that one too. What, what are you, what kind of things are you thinking about nowadays? Yeah. See, everybody should get this one. Wait. Yeah. You, you dropped out of uh, existence there for a second. Yeah. We're, we're back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wait, this is, no, this is the other one. Yeah. That's the other one. All right. This one. There Get we go. One. Understand knowledge. Boom. <coughs> um, yeah, what kind of things do you think about nowadays? What are you working on? Um, you know, like I, I have a paper about uh, the problem of other minds. Oh, nice. So, uh, so Uriah Kriegel invited me to um, contribute a paper to Oxford Studies and Philosophy of Mind. Mm. Um, so, you know, I just wrote this thing about the problem of other minds and uh, how it relates to dualism. 
Nice. Um, yeah, I got to see that. That's going to be awesome. I'm excited. Um, well, awesome, folks. That's going to have to do it for now for us. Uh, but this, you go go and follow uh, Doctor Humor stuff. I will drop all the links in the description. Uh, I want to hear from you guys. I do still read the comments. We're not that big that I I uh, am too big for you guys yet. So leave all your crazy nonsense in the comments, and uh, I'll follow back up with you guys. If you like this uh, episode, leave me like a little thinking emoji. Helps the algorithm. That would be great. Um, and if you if you enjoyed, if you learned something, consider becoming a Patreon patron or a YouTube member. That's going to have to do it for now. This has been Parker's Pensies, and as always, all glory to God.